started. Hello, welcome to our webinar on AI in contemporary art, critical perspectives. I'm Flora Zhu, a sophomore from Greenick South High School, New York State. I'm a student volunteer for the Planet Plus AI program. I will be your moderator for this webinar. The speaker for this talk, Luba Elliott, is a curator and researcher specializing in AI art. She works to educate and engage the broader public about the recent developments in AI art through talks and exhibitions at venues across the art, business, and technology spectrum, including the Serpentine Galleries, Arabite, ZKM, VNA Museum, Impact Festival, COGX, Neural PS, and ICCV. Her recent projects include the Unit London exhibition, The Perfect Error, and the RAI Festival in Leicester, UK. She founded the Neural PS Creativity and Design Workshop and curated the online galleries AIOnline.com and ComputerVisionArt.com. She is an honorary senior research fellow at the UCL Center for Artificial Intelligence. Prior to that, she worked in startups, including the AI art collector database, Larry's List. She obtained her undergraduate degree in modern languages at the University of Cambridge. Ms. Luba Elliott will present artists who investigate systems, infrastructures, and applications of AI. This will cover artists who investigate the components of AI systems, such as data sets and classification, and look at the social impact of technologies, such as facial recognition, recommendation systems, and deep fakes. Ms. Luba Elliott, I'll give it to you. Thank you so much, Flora, for the lovely introduction. And yeah, I'm delighted to be here and give you the second lecture of my sort of like AI art series. So as Flora mentioned, sort of in the first session, I gave an overview of artists who work more with um, sort of visual topics and aesthetics. And in this session, we'll cover artists who look at AI and its components a little bit more critically. So yeah, I'll get started. And um, yeah, I want to start with artists who think a lot about the data set component, right? Because particularly in the GAN era, like the data set is kind of a very important part of uh, kind of any artwork process because it affects sort of a lot of, of what the output might be. And of course, beyond the artwork, it has kind of impact in any other field um, it is applied to. So Sebastian Schmieg is an artist who wanted to look at various terms that are quite broad, like problem, future, past, and solution, and see how we can maybe match these words to, uh, to images. And uh, in his work, he yeah he looked at a data set of images and then he invited individuals to um, state which four of the categories they thought it uh, belonged to. So problem, solution, past, and future. So in these images, you can kind of see that if if you're looking for problems, then you might have everything from cars to children to people partying. If you think about um, ah, the solution, if you think about the solution, then it could be anything like parrots or Arts Council in England, and this is a funding body in, in England. If you think about if you think about the past, it could be anything from ice cream to sofas. And if you look into the future, it could be anything from a solar eclipse to people with guns. So you see all these um, kind of loose uh, terms are very difficult to maybe find exact image mappings to. And of course, this problem um, exists in kind of many systems that perhaps rely on accurate classification. And yes, yeah, Sebastian Schmig wanted to highlight that. 
And Mimi Onoha is uh, an artist based in the US who has been looking into, yeah, data sets of uh, African-American communities and other um, communities which might not be represented in various data sets. So in, in this work called the Library of Missing Data Sets, you can see what types of uh, data sets might not exist. So publicly available gun trace data, accurate historical weather data, and kind of all these other kind of data sets. And as you look through the folder, you will find that the files are empty. So there are kind of no data sets on these topics, even though many of us, many of us perhaps would like to uh, see data on that. And artists such as Caroline Sinders might take kind of a different approach. So they look at data sets which might be problematic or which might have aspects missing and they think, okay, what can we do to kind of fill that gap or to steer the direction or the bias of data sets in a different direction? And um, yeah, so in her work, The Feminist Data Set, Caroline Sanders has been uh, conducting workshops where artists, activists, and anybody interested can sort of gather together and find ways of making data sets that are feminist and their approach to kind of counterbalance all the data that's been kind of gathered from earlier times when, you know, the outlook might have been a bit more patriarchal. So, um, so yeah, that was that was her project, and um, yeah. Now I'll look at at some projects that think, um, yeah, about kind of the way biased data sets sort of uh, influence results. And um, Libby Heaney had a project called the Brit Bot, and um, she made a bot that you could interact with. And this bot was trained on the answers to the British citizenship test, which was supposed to epitomize Britishness, right? But uh, in the end, this test was derided by some as, as something that included too many kind of historical references and wasn't really quite an accurate representation of modern Britain. And if you interacted with this with this test, you would uh, sometimes receive quite odd answers. And um, I think this was kind of shown in many venues in the UK to also engage the audiences here who might be born with a British passport to see what an AI sees Britishness as kind of based on this test. And uh, it was, I think, quite eye-opening and interesting to find some of the things that, um, yeah, it, it perceives it as, as British. And yeah, she's also an artist who's been working with deepfakes. And yeah, let's see if, if this video will play. Um, oh, maybe. Ah, okay. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, can you hear the music in this or the sound? Uh, currently we can't. Okay, then, then it doesn't matter. I can sort of talk over it because it's not, not really um, kind of crucial. So, um, yeah, so Libby Heaney made this work around the time of Brexit, so when Britain decided to leave the EU, that sort of looked at the politics between these two countries and the way it was becoming a bit of a fuss. So this was done around 2018, so, uh, you know, maybe deepfake technology wasn't advanced back then, but she wanted to kind of put these leading politicians, so Theresa May, who was the Prime Minister of the UK, and Angela Merkel, who was the Chancellor of Germany, and she wanted to put them in the uh, Eurovision format, right, so this kind of uh, fun uh, event where people sing songs, because ultimately she thought that, uh, yeah, politics was, was a farce, and I think that was kind of a lovely... Um, 
yeah, a lovely video that made fun of politicians and also kind of highlighted how deep fakes can um can be used to oh yeah, I guess for critical purposes. Yeah. And so let's move on to the next slide I have. Um yeah, and uh, this is um, this is a work by Jake Ells, which also looks at deep fakes, but from a slightly different angle. So uh, Jake Ells is an artist who is interested. I'm going to play this. Who is interested in in drag? So you know the trend where kind of artists uh, are dress up and then sort of like perform, and I guess it's based a lot around gender fluidity and inclusivity and um yeah so this work is part of a series of works done by jake in which they investigate the data sets we currently have which uh, i suppose are normally quite gendered so a lot of the data sets might be from kind of women or men and um kind of through the zizi project jake wanted to kind of include faces which are a lot more um yeah faces which which are a lot more uh i think yeah gender fluid and to kind of include these ideas in in, in data sets and uh yeah so this is one of the parts of the zz project that yeah showcases various performers um kind of dancing in drag and it's all kind of deep fake and uh ai generated to kind of um yeah, showcase what that might look like. And yeah, now I'll mention some works that look at uh, recommendation algorithms. And um, yeah, I begin here with Scott Kelly and Ben Polkinghorn, two artists from New Zealand who made a series of uh, billboards that they placed in uh, natural parks in New Zealand and other venues. And so when you go to a national park in New Zealand or anywhere, you probably, I mean, you're not really looking for a sign that will provide you with recommendations of other national parks you might go to, right? You probably just want to um, enjoy nature. And so I think this work sort of highlighted how maybe shopping or recommendation systems or technology in general really kind of uh, infiltrates in, um, in the way we, we operate. And yeah, here is blocking a slide, so it sort of almost defeats the, the the basic function of it. And yeah, so I think these works, um, yeah, to me, they kind of stand out in a way because they're quite offline. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they really, um, yeah, they really sort of show the effect technology has on us. And Gretchen Andrew is an artist who looks at uh, the way recommendation engines influence the results of uh, yeah, search engines. And she made these um, kind of beautiful, um, I think these are like physical works where she included uh, a variety of mixed media to make these. And then she took photographs of them and proceeded to um, yeah, make SEO pages, SEO optimized pages that uh, if you search for a particular search string and you put it in quotation marks, then uh, if you click on images, then her results would come top. So I think the last time I did this was sometime last year. And of course, these, um, uh, yeah, the, the search engine results, because the algorithms are optimized, sometimes they change. But I remember she had a series of works and consistently the images she picked would would end up in the top results. And I think this is quite a powerful way of um, influencing the maybe the data sets or the results from her individual perspective, perhaps as a feminist artist. And um, yeah, because she also had um, things related to exhibitions and uh, yeah, auction results, magazine titles, so things people in the art industry who she might want to reach would search for. And yeah, it's, it's quite a uh, interesting artwork. 
And then Sam Levine is an artist who is thinking more about the way, um, I suppose, yeah, recommendation engines typically operate in social media because they're optimized to show us the most, I think, scandalous results or the results that um, kind of have garnered the most attention or reactions from from either our friends or the demographic we're part of. And suddenly you thought, okay, what could we do if we could optimize results for a different set of uh, outcomes? So in this project called Other, or Other Orders, he looked instead at what if you optimize something for uh, the most apocalyptic results, or you could have the most density of nouns and all these other gothness things and uh, yeah I think that really kind of uh, sort of makes you think about the amount of information that is out there generated through all these social media streams and the way it could be organized because of course um, the metrics these systems use maybe aren't the most beneficial ones to us. And yeah now I will look at uh, image uh, recognition and um, yeah, in this work called uh, The Flemish Scrollers, Dries de Porter, who is an artist based in Belgium, he, I think he, he looked into one of the live streams of the Flemish parliament sessions. So you've got all these like politicians sitting and then he used an image kind of recognition algorithm to identify which politician it was and uh, also the amount of time that we're looking at their phone. And I think this was, I know this was picked up by a variety of different newspapers because of course, um, if you have elected these politicians, maybe you don't want them to be spending so much of their time in parliament looking into their phones. I mean, of course it might be possible that they're preparing something related to a remark they will make later, but um, still, I think Dries wanted to kind of, yeah, maybe probe what's happening in, in one of these spaces. And that's uh, another one of his work that looks at uh, the data sets that are kind of out in the open and how images from them can be linked to posts made on Instagram. So he found this kind of Instagram post of, of a lady I think outside a pub and then he kind of managed to trace the um tr trace the point and, and the time um that she was kind of standing there through the through the kind of the, the live um the live stream um yeah data set yeah so you can see who's standing there and um, yeah, and this project called uh, ImageNet Roulette, um, I think was, yeah, it was quite interesting uh, a few years back and got a lot of, I think, media attention because it was in some ways quite controversial. So Trevor Paglin and Kay Crawford, so Trevor Paglin is an artist who specializes a lot in photography and also kind of AI, and Kay Crawford is, is I think, I uh, also a researcher who looks into kind of AI safety, AI ethics, and sort of related topics. So I think this was a great collaboration in that it drew both from kind of arts and, and science. And uh, in ImageNet Roulette, there used to be like a website that you could go on and upload a photo. And when your photo was uploaded, it would um kind of look at your face and then provide you with these um yeah with what it recognized so here it's written cloud buffoon goof and and so on and some of these um descriptions are quite maybe stereotypical uh, they could also be racist or biased and um yeah something that you don't kind of necessarily expect when maybe using when 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 using one of these web tools. And because it was called ImageNet Roulette, it wanted to um, sort of highlight some of the issues and the biases that exist in uh, the ImageNet dataset. 
which of course has been the core of uh, so many um, kind of machine learning um, yeah, models. And yeah, so Sam Levy wanted, um, yeah, in this project called the uh, White Collar Crime, he wanted to kind of, yeah, think about uh, the notions of crime differently and focus more on financial crime. And um, yeah, so he, he looks at the neighborhoods in New York that, um, that are kind of most likely to engage in these types of crime, which he also lists as failure to supervise, defamation, or buying trading dispute. And uh, yeah, I think he goes about kind of identifying some of the faces there and the types of crimes they could um, they, they could be part of. Um, because of course, I think in traditional crime reporting, it's often like maybe other demographics that are sort of subjected to increased probing. And I think, yeah, some of you wanted to focus on uh, the typical kind of banker and the types of, uh, of, of crimes that, that might occur in that profession. And um, yeah, there's also a group of artists who think a lot about um, yeah, the devices we have in our homes, such as Google Home or Amazon Alexa, and the roles they play in our lives. So Laura Lee McCarthy's been doing a lot of work kind of thinking about that. And um, she normally kind of operates through performance or things like that. And um, in this project called Lauren, she decided that she would be kind of the, um, yeah, the, 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 the Alexa in that she would embody the functions typically undertaken by those tools. So she would dim the lights, she would kind of switch on the music and things like that to kind of make the inhabitants um, yeah, comfortable. And this, this also underscores how much um yeah how much influence we give away to these technologies and um yeah it makes you kind of really kind of think what if it was a human doing all these things how would you feel about it and um yeah she has uh, continued working with um with kind of with the latest developments in um in ai and uh, in one of her newest projects, which was done after the advent of ChatGPT and kind of this new opportunity of, uh, of everyone being able to have a conversation with the AI system and kind of through that get increasingly improved results. And Lauren thought, okay, what if I could incorporate ChatGPT into my, um, my daily interactions with people? And um, yeah, she kind of, uh, she started working with it. And I think in her headphones, there's a voice that tells her that maybe she should be kind of calmer in the situations or she should kind of adapt her behavior and what she says in a certain way to kind of achieve her goals. So again, it's thinking about how you can use some of these tools in different situations and whether it's something that we might want as a society or not. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, facial recognition is one of the topics that's been extremely popular in uh, the activist AI art community. So I feel there are like, so many projects and a lot of them have been led by Adam Harvey, who is a researcher and technologist originally from the US, but now based in Berlin. And uh, this is called CV Dazzle. It's a project from uh, 2015. So already it's quite a long time ago. But um, I think this kind of idea of fooling or avoiding detection by algorithms has still kind of, it's still been ongoing and will <laughs> we'll continue for a long time. But anyway, at this point in time, if you had these two kind of triangular marks on your face, then there would be no face detection, but if you only had one, then the algorithm would see, see a face. 
and also similarly with uh, weird um, weird hairstyles, they they would also kind of stop you from being recognised as uh, as a face. And then, kind of as these systems were being developed and improved to kind of avoid, let's say, hacking from these types of systems, um, Adam Harvey developed. Uh, yeah, new ways of going, of going, of going around. And um, hyperface is one of these where he blends the you know the face to the background and avoids facial detection kind of that way. And um, yeah, lately he's also been working on uh, exposing AI, which is a project that looked at the data sets that exist and uh, the type of data that might be in them, right? Because a lot of them might rely on uh, data from Flickr, which hasn't, uh, let's say, necessarily been kind of transferred with uh, with the permission of all these people who took the photographs. So I think he was trying to kind of highlight some of the issues that might exist in all these individual data sets and, um, yeah, the, the, the state of them. And yeah, um, other artists have uh, also kind of thought about how might you want to escape facial recognition in a more elegant way. So the Polish designer Eva Novak has come up with this um, kind of fashion accessory. I think it was in 2019 where you could wear this kind of gold, almost like yeah, device across your forehead and on your cheeks and through that avoid being detected as a face. Um, yeah, likewise, uh, Shinji Toya um, had uh, a project where if you wanted to upload something on the internet, you could kind of use this uh, paint your face away tool that uh, kind of enabled you to paint over your face until, you know, for sure it has been kind of anonymized and the system kind of operating could no longer find a face. And um, yeah, Zach Blass is, um, is somebody who also looked maybe at the concept of jewelry or like these kind of metallic decoration, but in a somewhat uh, different way. So he was thinking about the way these faces of biometric data is gathered and the types of shapes that are being generated by these systems. And he wanted to see, okay, what would one of these masks or shapes look like in real life? So he proceeded to print one of these biometric facial shapes and then invite the human whose kind of biometric face it was supposedly corresponded to to wear it and um yeah it's not the most comfortable mask to wear and it's uh it sort of kind of highlights how some of these uh ways of working or recognizing might restrict the individual in um kind of in some ways or maybe the types of services they're able to access or kind of what happens with the facial and biometric information going forward so I think, yes, it's quite an interesting project. And um, yeah, and Kate Rose was uh, looking at uh, fooling uh, the license plate recognition system. So she made this dress where like all these kind of license plate type um, images on her dress would kind of trigger the license plate recognition system and kind of in that way confuse it and yeah other artists such as Jing Kai Lu projected as somebody else's face onto onto your own so you can see the artist has sort of like made a headband with a projector that yeah tries to project somebody else's face onto you and through that you can sort of avoid being seen as your individual face uh, okay, see uh, the model talking. And um, yeah, and others still, like Constant Dillard, I uh, found um, different ways to kind of, um, yeah, again, to avoid the face coming across as a face. And so 
this project called Blot no, Dull Dream is almost like a play on Deep Dream, which I mentioned in the first uh, lecture I gave, which uh, you, you might kind of recognize. So Deep Dream was this technology that looked at images, it got excited by certain features, and proceeded to kind of invent things that might not be there, so either colors or shapes and so on. And with Dull Dream, it was the opposite that happened. So the image was being dulled, so the colors were reduced, and uh, yeah, the shapes and the images became a bit less recognizable. So I think this is quite an interesting parallel. And in the case of Constant Dullard, who is the artist behind it, it was also an example of kind of what can you do with your photographs and images to make them kind of less recognizable in terms of a particular face or a particular scene. And yeah. Um, yeah. There are other projects that looked at the, the difficulties of image recognition. And yeah, one of these was um, awarded to, um, one of these was that there was a Tate, which is um, a big contemporary art gallery here in London. Uh, IK prize uh, for digital innovation and this prize was awarded to um, the team called Recognition which uh, was tasked with finding a ways of connecting I think contemporary photojournalism to art from the Tate collection and uh, here you can ha here you have various examples where the I think where various kind of AI systems, I think there's kind of sentiment analysis, image recognition, and so on, that try to link the two images. And on, on the left, you have two eunuchs applying makeup before Raksha Bandha Festival celebration in Mumbai. And on the right, you would have two classical ladies kind of um, yeah, playing musical instruments. And in some ways, you can see that, yes, there are some parallels. The, the, the people in the images are wearing beautiful dresses, and they've got kind of something in their hands. But on the other hand, there's also quite a gulf in uh, the time periods and the activity that they're undertaking. And yeah, similarly, this was an interesting kind of link between the images. So on the left, you have... Uh, one of these car seats from a German manufacturer. And on the right, you have a Henry Moore sculpture. So these two are sort of linked through maybe the poses. And because you can you can see in the Henry Moore sculpture with the kind of with the figure that lying down, the, the head does look like a headdress. So it's sort of it's it's understandable how AI would kind of link the two shapes together. And also this one, which I quite like. So you have somebody sitting in front of the computer and uh, a scholar from kind of earlier on looking into his, uh, his book and kind of thinking about it. So I think some of these uh, links can be quite unexpected and might sort of make you think, oh, maybe car seat manufacturers were inspired by um by sculpture from you know earlier on in the 20th century or like maybe not um so sometimes these things can be quite surprising and yeah um the artists think about the way um recognition um as, as a tool might be used like quite in a quite prescriptive way so currently Fogler is a Dutch artist who worked uh, together with a model to come up with um, with different kind of, uh, yeah, to look into human emotions, right? So you have happy, sad, angry, surprised, scared, disgusted, and contempt. And in this work called The Random String of Emotions, the, yeah, the, the, Kind of the model would initially uh, exhibit all these emotions, and uh, there'd be a system that would map like the exact movements her face would undertake. 
And then they proceeded to train the machine learning system to kind of, to generate kind of, yeah, different possible variations of these facial movements that would make sense based on the data set. And then these emotions, and then the actors had to contort her face to um, make these kind of actions happen. And then the AI system was trying to recognize which kind of emotion. So that was disgust, anger, sadness, happy, surprise. So you can kind of see that the types of emotions that are identified, um, or maybe the expressions or the faces the model pulls, or maybe not the stereotypical ones you would escape, you would expect for sadness or um, happiness and that sort of shows how sometimes the AI systems might have a different understanding of what some of these um, possibilities of moving the face and exhibiting emotions might be. Um, oh yeah and in her more recent work uh, currently Fogola looked also at some um, yeah, at the links between sort of uh, the way uh, bins sort of like sort trash, because I think there is some sort of algorithm or um, a technical approach that uh, trash companies use to kind of pack trash as efficiently as possible. And she worked with one of these algorithms and uh, and, and, and a band of classical dancers to try and kind of package them according to this principle of like trash as efficiently as possible. And she made kind of this, uh, this sculpture out of it. And in some ways I think it's quite an interesting sculpture because maybe it does refer to a lot of the classical uh, sort of friezes and sculptures that you might find in a museum. But yeah, there is this link also to um yeah to the kind of to bins and trash and um yeah artists like um james bridal also think a lot about um yeah the ways all these um ai systems are being kind of developed and the limitations they might face so here you see a car that's um, sort of inside a circle and this is supposed to be a self-driving car and because it's in this circle which i think is marked out by salt it's not going to be able to um move out of it um yes yeah, sorry i was just checking the chat and yeah if we move on um, yeah, so Jeff Thompson thought um, thought about um, our daily sort of existence with smartphones and so on, and uh, he he kind of he mapped how often and where he touched the phone, and then he kind of made this robot hand that was kind of trained on all the movements of. Um, that kind of he typically would make as a as a phone user and then kind of he proceeded to make this robot that would touch his hand in the places where he touches the the phone so i think it's an interesting kind of reversal of our typical action with uh, technology and um yes yeah, so it probably makes you think also how addicted you are to your phone and how often you um you touch it and I think I will skip this one. And um, yeah, um, her her role van den Loon is um is another Dutch artist who is thinking a lot about kind of reinforcement learning and uh, what we are actually teaching the the robots. And um, you've got these. Sort of, you, you've got these videos that he's made with this robot that is trying to kind of uh, make these uh, human poses, right? So in an image on the left, 
the robot is standing by the pizza tower and you kind of see that in an ideal image the robot or the human would need to be further left so they would sort of like hold up the the tower or something like that and similarly on the right the person kind of hitting the golf ball would maybe need to kind of position themselves slightly differently so and these are, I think, TikTok videos that the artist has been sort of thinking about and putting these a humanoid robot, robots into. And through that, he's trying to suggest that we're also teaching all these systems maybe sort of optimal or kind of non-ideal ways of doing certain actions because, you know, we as humans don't only upload perfect um content and it's not necessarily the perfect content that gets the most likes and so on and uh, yeah so thinking about the ecosystems or the way um a lot of these gadgets are produced um kate crawford uh, collaborated with blood and jolla to think um to create a map of uh kind of how an Amazon Alexa might come into existence and all the different processes and um, materials that might be needed. So, um, yeah, so if you look at this graphic in detail, it would kind of talk about all the extractions of the metals and uh, materials such as lithium from the different systems and all the human labor involved and then also all the kind of technical software processes and development that needs to undergo so like maps like these really help you to understand how much kind of work and natural resources go into one of these technology um, projects and um, yeah, Wesley Goodley um, an artist based here in the UK uh, showed in a recent exhibition a project with uh, a lot of um, Amazon Echoes that have been discarded because the technology keeps being updated and some of the older versions are no longer in use. So they will be kind of playing sounds in this kind of graveyard of uh, disused technical objects. And um, yeah, I think for my final few slides, I'm, I'm looking at artists who think yeah, about the ethical issues around kind of AI. And in this work called The Trial of the Super Debt Hunter Bot, uh, the artist Helen Knowles, so this was like back in 2016, she made a video about this fictional trial of a bot um, that I think that somehow was responsible for the death of three individuals because they took part in some uh, medical trials and um and yeah the trial was about to what extent was the bot responsible and it was kind of a long video that you could watch and hear all the different arguments voiced by lawyers the tech people and so on and it sort of like made you think and this was of course like in 2016 maybe when ai powers were not as let's say, advanced as they are now, but I think it's always kind of important to be talking about these uh, these issues because, of course, now we face a lot of discussions and, um, yeah, a division around AI and copyright, and we're still trying to figure, figure it out, even though, like, the internet is being flooded with AI-generated content. And, um, yeah, another artistic project on that topic was the website called have i been trained and i was trying to access it today but it wasn't sort of working for some reason so maybe now it's out of use but it was made by holly Handel and matt dryhurst so two artists and musicians who've been working with ai over the years and uh, through this website you could upload an image and then it would tell you what is the likelihood that your image was part of one of these like lay on data sets that had been used to train tools like Midjourney and um, stable diffusion and and so on. And um, yeah, so I, I guess uh, AI art um, 
yeah, done through these systems. These text image systems have been proliferating. And um, this work by James M. Allen won uh, the first prize at the Colorado State Fair. And to anyone who's been, I think, looking at mid-journey art over the past couple of years, you would notice that it's quite, um, yeah, it's quite typical of that era. But uh, of course, James would argue that, you know, it took him 600 prompt attempts to get the perfect version. And then he also worked with Photoshop on so on to get the image. So whether this work kind of was justifiably awarded first place amongst all the other works that maybe had less technological and more human input is, um, yeah, is to be decided. But what was interesting that James uh, tried to um, get copyright approved for this image and um, yeah, the, the, the body of science copyright said no because there was kind of not enough human involvement which, which is quite an interesting precedent. And similarly with this work by Stephen Taylor. So uh, Stephen proclaims that this was done by this like program, which is completely autonomous, and he tried to get copyright assigned for it, but again, he failed because the judges said that, yeah, it, it might be novel, but uh, there is kind of no human involvement and course it's interesting how it's kind of playing out now because it might influence a lot of other projects and um yeah i think this is probably my um yeah maybe my final slide but um yeah so on on one hand you have um, on the left you have boris elvaxen who entered the sony photo awards and uh, he was i think almost awarded a prize in one of the categories but then he declined because the image was AI generated. And uh, on the image on the right by Annika Norden, Norden Stewart, is uh, an image that uh, won the first AI generated uh, photography biennial in, um, in Australia. And in that image, you have two women sort of hugging uh, some sort of like octopus creature, which is probably quite a fantastical scenario and I, I guess what struck me in these kind of images is how similar they are they're both black and white they're both feature kind of two women um from let's say a more classical photography period in the 20th century and um yeah I guess they're both um AI, AI, AI generated but they seem to like captivate audiences quite a lot. So um, I guess we will see how these um, developments will pan out as AI will continue to generate ever more uh, realistic images and artists and creators will kind of be able to tweak the images or what is um, kind of produced much more to their liking and I guess what impact that will have on the ecosystem and um, yeah, the creative output that we will see. So I think, yeah, so just one um, suppose plug for the CVPR AI Art Gallery, which um, I'm curating and which will be at the CVPR conference in June. So yeah, the deadline for submissions is the 10th of March. And yeah, you can submit any art that you've made with or about computer vision. Um, I, I think it, it's good if it's reasonably recent work, so either from 2014 or from 2013. And if you've seen both of these talks, so we're open to artwork that looks at um, both sort of the pretty images side of AI art and also art that is made more critical. And as you've seen here, look, looks at classification, image recognition, or tools like that. So yeah, here are also my details, and um, I believe there is a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, Ms. Luba Elliott, thank you again for your phenomenal presentation. We enjoyed it a lot, and of course, we have some questions in the chat. So let's move on th to the Q and A part. Great. 
So for me, um, I have an AI club in my school and many of the club members are preparing to submit their artwork to the CVPR AI art gallery, which you've talked about. And could you please kindly give us some tips and suggestions, please? <laughs> Sure, yeah, I think in the last few words I said, they're almost like tips and suggestions, but yeah, as, as I said, I think the date thing is uh, in some ways, yeah, quite, um, quite important. So if you're able to send us reasonably recent work, and so maybe projects that you're working on now or that you worked on last year, then that would be good because we want to be a snapshot of the current practice. And um, yeah, I think you should kind of see what you're interested in and what data sets you might have. So as it's a planetary sciences school, you probably have um, a lot of interesting data sets of maybe Earth or kind of, I don't know, like satellites or kind of all these different images and see what you can kind of make with them, both through kind of all these generative tools and also maybe with recognition tools and maybe you could combine with this data set with uh, I don't know something from uh, another kind of artist or another completely different subject matter like I don't know portraits or still lives and see what kind of parallels or things you can draw and um, yeah maybe like combine it with whatever else you're interested in so for example I really like um, swimming in cold water so at one point when I was are thinking of how to title or conceive an exhibition, I was like, oh, I'm going to call it Reflections in the Water because I can also see how you can make parallels between the way nature seasons develop and the way artists work with AI. So that, that might be helpful. Okay, thank you. I'll definitely keep that in mind. Um, so let's move on to the second question. So Ms. Luba Elliott, do you think of yourself as an AI artist? Um, so I would probably say no, because I'm mainly a curator, sort of a uh, community organizer. So I mainly look at the works done by other artists and put those together in presentations, events and exhibitions. However, a while back when I was getting into this field and uh, 2016 or so, I also dabbled a bit in making art. So I had this performance piece that people sort of like acted out words that were AI generated or not AI generated. And then, you know, audiences need to figure out who was kind of playing the AI part and who was like completely human and so on. But I sort of realized that I preferred being a curator rather than being an artist. Okay, thank you. Oh, here's an interesting question. So there's a lot of controversies around AI art. So for example, some artists say AI companies kind of steal artworks from artists without paying them as the training data. And the artists want all AI development to be stopped. So I'm wondering if you could give us your opinion on this. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I, I agree in that it's kind of not great that you know, tech companies and the researchers there who earn a lot of money, they kind of maybe get all this like data set from Flickr and DeviantArt and then they train the systems on it. And yeah, now they develop models that can generate these kind of beautiful images very similar to the types of images that humans might have been able to uh, produce before. I think that is a problem because maybe these like commissions or illustrations or these like science fiction type of images uh, maybe they weren't always kind of the most exciting type of art but it's something that people were paid for and as an artist it's normally quite tricky to um, earn a living so if you take away kind of some of this basic work that artists are paid for it's um, kind of not ideal and yeah I do think artists should be paid if their work has been part of a data set that then is kind of, uh, that then leads to being part of a generated image. But I think in reality, that is quite complicated to execute because of course these data sets are extremely large and um, 
yeah, also maybe tracing which exact images contributed to this particular artwork is quite tricky and also kind of assigning how much to pay. But um, I definitely do think there should be kind of some schemes, incentives, either from the technology community or from the government to make sure that artists are able to maybe find new ways of kind of living or the technology companies um yeah kind of pass on some of the benefits to to artists okay thank you so what do you think of the current ai systems infrastructures and applications in art um what do i think i mean i think nowadays there's almost an excessive focus on chat gpt and text to image art so certainly i'm interested more by artists who either use these systems a bit more critically or those who um, use other ways like, um, I don't know, genetic algorithms or, um, yeah, kind of other tools to make art. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Here's the next question. So based on your personal experience in curating AI art, I'm wondering if you could comment on how the other artists navigate AI systems and challenges through their artistic expressions. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think it really depends what the individual artist is uh, interested in. Right, so there are some who are always kind of critical of these AI systems, and then whenever something new comes out, they're keen to showcase the limitations and the issues. And then you might have, um, I think, some other artists who kind of yeah apply these new tools in unexpected ways, or have kind of. Uh, their own topics or agendas that they might try and sort of further develop or explore through these AI systems. So I think it really kind of depends on the types of type of artists and what they're looking to do. Because I think in the presentation I gave today, a lot of the artists, they're sort of yeah, always quite activist. They can code a lot and they want to maybe highlight yeah the issues of these systems so that the general population is aware of the biases and so on okay got it could you please comment on the ethical perspective surrounding technologies like recommendation systems deep fakes and facial recognition um well i think the ethics would depend on how you apply these tools right so um, I think there are a lot more concerns when these tools are applied in the public sector. So, for example, if an insurance company is using data from your health provider to kind of determine what quote to give you, or if your bank is trying to figure out if it can give you uh, a mortgage based on I don't know, something you posted on Facebook that might make you seem as somebody less financially reliable, so I think there are certainly kind of a lot of questions uh, that need to be answered if these systems are used in the public domain, because, of course, often they're trained on systems that are somewhat biased. And, um, and yeah, I think in some countries or in some kind of projects, uh, you get like this a card that details a bit more about um, the data set, the types of data that might be in it and uh, what kind of use cases are the best for it. And I think it's kind of good if public institutions are aware of the limitations of the tools they kind of use and they also share this information with, uh, with the public too. Okay. All right, our final question. Some people would say that AI will be the greatest equalizer of creativity. So what's your opinion on that? The greatest equalizer of creativity? Um, 
Yeah, I guess it depends how you define creativity, right? Because I think with AI, if you have kind of great ideas, AI presents you many more opportunities to execute them, right? Because then you have kind of this vision that you can describe very well in words and you can write a well-crafted prompt, then you'll get a high quality image. You don't need to be able to be the expert painter. But I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's kind of, um, yeah, maybe a different form of creativity because it would be a shame if uh, nobody would paint or would know how to paint anymore, right? Because I think it's still, let's say, a technique and a tool that is variable, very valuable to learn because if you continue kind of working with it, you might kind of develop a different type of image as opposed to if you were just kind of writing a prompt that would, let's say, make you an oil painting. So I think, yeah, AI is, uh, yeah, is, is great for, um, yeah, for, for offering more options to um, kind of, yeah, to, to execute your um, creativity, yeah. Is Luba Elliott, Thank you again for your wonderful presentation and also answering our questions. Thank you all for joining us today and I hope to see you again on our next webinar. All right, thank you all. It was lovely to be part of it. Thank you.